All right. I was at the bookstore recently and I found this book. I want to show it to you and we're going to look at it tonight. It is called Uncommon Kitchen Design. There it is there by Sophie Donaldson. And it is a very interesting book uh, about kitchen design. And it is a collection of different designers' kitchens. And then they have all of these takeaways. Let me show you these takeaways here. I'll show it to you over here. Uh, that they um, they show there. Look, it kind of has these takeaways. You can see that all right. Uh, different uh, things that the designer uh, recommends. And so what we're going to do tonight is I want to read through some of these because some of them are really good. Some of them I, I disagree with. Some of them you might disagree with. But there's a whole bunch of these. I have them all sticky noted here. So you can see there that um, we can kind of go through and see what the designer is saying and, and some of these takeaways. I'm not going to show you any pictures of these um, particular, you know, maybe just from the from the screen here. But um, so these are just all design tips from different designers that are in this collection in this book called Uncommon Kitchens. You can buy this at, you know, any bookstore, I guess, or maybe on Amazon if you want to. Maybe when this goes in the replay I'll add an Amazon link and you can get it from there if you'd like. But uh, regardless, let's just jump into this. So this is, again, by Sophie Donaldson, and it's a collection of di different kitchens from around the world, really. And then the designers' takeaways from, from the different reasons and thoughts behind what they do in, in certain designs. So let me start reading some of this and, and we can uh, start up a conversation. Of course, if you're watching this live, say hi in the chat. If you're watching the replay, I'd love to hear from you in the comment section. And be sure to put a thumbs up down there and because uh, they're free and they make me feel good on the inside. <laughs> all right. Here, so here's the first one just to give you an idea of what this is all about. And uh, hopefully, maybe I can put this here so we can, I don't have to be looking down so much. Uh, the first thing, this was uh, from Francis Morell of Wreath Design in Los Angeles. And there's uh, all kinds of these uh, different designers from everywhere. Design the kitchen for doing more than just chopping. There's enough drudgery in the kitchen. There can be enjoyment too. So put something in there that signals leisure like art or furniture. So you get these different tips. Maybe they're interior design tips. Maybe they're architectural tips. Maybe they're actually functional tips and, and all, all the like. And hopefully it'll cause you to maybe think, yeah, I never thought of that. Or maybe just spark an idea about something in your own kitchen. Here's something that um, that is good. Uh, there are no quick tips for choosing color patterns. There you go. I mean, just forget YouTube. Don't go there for your quick tips. It's a combination of preparation and taking a risk, spending time thinking about it, uh, but also being prepared to jump in. You got to make that decision. This is one that I really like. Get to know your stuff, all your stuff. The designers behind this kitchen that, that they're talking about inventory and photograph every single item meant to go in the cabinet or drawer. Measure the tallest bottle before choosing shelf height. Consider where your heaviest Dutch oven will go, ideally somewhere where you don't need to bend over or reach up too high to retrieve it. This is something that I talk about in some of my videos and content about knowing what's going in the kitchen and not just leaving it up to chance later on. They're actually taking pictures of all the items, measuring everything so that they can have a catalog and inventory of the things that are going to be used in that kitchen. I think that's a really good idea and something that uh, definitely uh, more people should do. All right, here's another one. I like this one. A big sink can help you relax. You don't always want a, a kitchen that must be completely uh, tidied every night. Put the dishes into one big deep sink so you don't have to look at them. Your design choices can help you sit down at the end of the day. This one I champion because I talk about it a lot on my channel is about having a large single sink. And here we have this very prominent designer from Wreath Designs saying a very similar thing. Doesn't that make me feel good? <laughs> Here's a good piece of advice. Make concessions. Don't ever squeeze something in just to check a box, like a banquette, if it just doesn't fit. You have to make choices, and that's okay. Sometimes, depending on the size of your space or the limitations that your kitchen has, you just can't fit that dream thing in there that maybe you want to, and that's fine. Uh, let's see. Here's a good one. Know your thing, in quotation marks. A warming drawer, a trash compactor, maybe you're wed to something. So go ahead and keep it. Just know about it. Just know it about yourself. What is your thing? This is something I also talk about in content in that 
there's things in your old kitchen that are horrible and need to go and design probably just is one of those factors but there's also things in your old kitchen that are absolutely great and should transfer into your new space so just because it's an older kitchen that maybe has some dysfunction doesn't mean it's all dysfunctional and everything has to be abandoned there might be some things that you want to carry on now it doesn't have to be a warming drawer or a trash compactor it can be any element of function or the way that you use the space that makes it more enjoyable or functional for you. So don't forget to keep those things when you're designing your new kitchen. All right, let's jump over to another designer. So that was from Francis Merrill, Wreath Designs. This is from Niccolo Castellini Baldissera. I bet you know where they're from. They're a designer and entrepreneur in Milan. Milan, I like saying that. It sounds posh. All right, let's see what this person is, is saying. For storage, think beyond cabinets. Cabinets can break the space in half, and when there are lots of them, you feel inclined to fill them up. Having less space forces you to organize yourself better. Try storing your cups and dishes in a cupboard in an adjacent room. Okay, Nicolo, this might be a stretch. Or use some small set of drawers for flatware. It doesn't have to be kitchen furniture per se. I like the idea of using other items in the kitchen as a, you know, a piece that is different, maybe something that's antique. I'm not necessarily sure that putting your cups and dishes in another room is the right answer. This is a European designer and generally speaking, sometimes these they have smaller kitchens and so they need to think outside the box. And so I think for us North Americans with our massive kitchens, we can tend to say, no, well, I want to fit everything into one room. So that could be maybe a hack for a real small space. Uh, but anyway, it's uh, interesting nonetheless. Okay, here's a good piece of advice uh, from Nicolo. Nicolo um, buy better than average quality appliances and keep them. When we move from this rental, we'll take with us as much as possible. My cooker, big fridge, most of the appliances as I bought them with the intention of bringing them with me. So they're in a rental, they renovated the kitchen. But the idea is, is yeah, you should have quality appliances that are gonna last you a good lifetime and that you do not have to replace very often. We talk a little bit about this. I've yet to have Yale Appliance on the channel for chat, though we've been back and forth at, at different times in the past, but I would love to get some really good idea about quality appliances and what what they are what are the brand names we should be looking at stuff like that because i think it's a very important part of your kitchen the kitchen is just boxes that have to fit around your appliances so you want to have really good appliances and then they have this thing here it's kind of just a, a little quote that they said a rug in the kitchen that's one thing i can't stand it's my only hygienic thing a floor in the kitchen must be clean in the best possible way so the idea of germs and debris, uh, I find rather disgusting. Funnily, 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 <laughs> is that a word? I break my own rule for the dining room where sometimes you need to combat noise, but I try to do that with curtains and not rugs. I'll leave the jury out on that one. I don't know how you feel about rugs or runners or mats in your kitchen. Sometimes they can be a potential tripping hazard. And sometimes they can be really great in the space. So maybe it depends a little bit on the rug. But uh, generally, I'm not a super fan of that. Um, but I'm no interior designer either. All right, let's jump to the next one. This is interesting. Uh, this is Jackie Searman, a designer from Los Angeles again. All right, let's go let's see what's something. Oh, hey, this one stands out. Rethink the work triangle. Older houses sometimes force this decision. Not every space can accommodate a work triangle. It's okay to rethink the layout. There are, here's, here's the, we know, here's a, here there's a food prep side, range fridge, bar sink, and a cleanup side, dishwasher, kitchen sink. It's not conventional, but it's functional. So in this particular, particular kitchen, they abandoned the work triangle. And we've talked about that a lot before on the live stream and in different pieces of content that I put out, that the work triangle is a starting point, but it's not the end piece that you need to get to in order for your kitchen to be functional. Your kitchen can be very functional when you think of it in terms of workflow, different work zones, and how those things relate to one another and how you use them and how other people in that space use those things. So 
I think this is a good one to really be challenged about the work triangle. And it's something that as a kitchen designer, we're forced to deal with all the time when we are designing for clients or designing for, you know, whatever we're designing for is to, is, is sometimes can be hard to abandon that idea that the work triangle is something we need to absolutely adhere to, but not necessarily so all the time. Repetition works. If you have a good thing going with your material palette, stick with it. A statement hood, like in copper, for example, would add even more materials to this room. But tapping on tile and brass, which already exists throughout, added to the continuity of the space. So what they're saying here, and of course, it helps if you can read the book and see the pictures to know what we're talking about. However, uh, we're just reading these. The idea is, is uh, just because you can add a new element doesn't mean you should, and it's okay to use repetition. So there you go. All right, let's go to the next designer. This is Marta Trapka, Trapka from Column Studio in Warsaw, Poland. Wow, there you go. So this is in Poland, Marta. All right, start with an idea about design. Oh, start with an idea about design, not function. What are you saying, Marta? What are you talking about? Begin with inspiration. It could be Joseph Frank furniture, for example, and then consider the story of people who live there. What's your way of living? How do you want to feel in the space? Yeah, I don't know. That's a little foo-foo for me. Just think of function first and <laughs> then design it nicely. For a cozy, for a kitchen to be cozy, it needs the right light. There we go. This is true. Uh, plus fabrics to make the interior softer and colors which are especially powerful when dark. Those elements combine to create a feeling of being safe. Well, yeah, I guess that's very true. And what else do we say? Oh, this is interesting. Banish long countertops. They keep you from moving naturally. Everything feels so far away. One meter in length feels just right. So that's about 36 inches, three feet. Um, I don't know how I feel about that necessarily. I think, again, because it's in, in Europe or just in that, that area of the world, um, they're just used to those smaller kitchens, possibly. And I think in North America, for sure, we tend to think of just more counter space, the better. So it's interesting to get these perspectives from other people from other places. Um, so you can kind of think of that. Think about those things. All right. To reinvent your kitchen again and again, use wood cabinets. You can repaint them and move the boxes into different configurations. Modern kitchen cabinets, materials like MDF and polyurethane paints look plastic, wear out quickly, and can't be restored. Uh, the, ineb the inability to age things well um, somehow deprives us of our heritage. So this is, might be a personal thing and maybe... You know, you want to use wood. I don't know if, again, in North America, are we going to be uh, moving our cabinets around? Not so much. So we we get them fitted, we get them installed, and they kind of stay that way. Generally, we're not going to be reconfiguring them. But if you have a smaller space or if you do plan, you know, maybe to do that, you know, using wood can be a good idea. Plus, I guess they're easy to, easier to uh, recycle later on for some other use. Uh, which, you know, maybe for a cabin or a cottage or you can sell them, stuff like that. All right. Let's go to somewhere else. Marta, you didn't, uh, you didn't, I don't think I liked any of your things. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Marta. Poppy Lissaman. That's a fun name. Fashion designer. Okay. So not all of these people are even kitchen designers. This is a fashion designer uh, and their take on it. So this is interesting. Uh, let's see if they have anything good to say about kitchens. Okay, the big furniture makes a room look bigger. Uh, banquette that fills a room seems huge, but it actually makes the space look bigger. Reuse whatever materials you can. If something is beautiful, if it has integrity, find a way to use it. It's responsible, and it just makes sense that you'd first use what's on hand. So again, it's the idea that you can reuse some furniture and it creates an interesting element in your kitchen if you want to. Make sure it's good quality and go with it. Here's an interesting piece of advice. Let your builder or contractor choose the subcontractors. I mean, I figure they would anyway, but don't bother researching and hiring your own subcontractors or getting recommendations from friends. The builder will always be better, will show up, and will get along with the team. Well, I don't know if that's true, Poppy, I think 
I think that that might not be true in all cases, but uh, I think it's an interesting piece of advice. It does save you a lot of time trying to research everybody when you can just go to the contractor and they are responsible for all of that stuff. So if something goes wrong, you just have one person to go to instead of going to three or four or five different people. So yeah, I think that's a good reason for that. Um, that doesn't guarantee your job's gonna go seamless though. So just be careful there. And let's see, allow your taste to mature, leave room to grow. If you shop resale furniture, you can swap things in and out, buying and selling. Taste grows and change. Tastes grow and change, and you want a house that can change alongside it. Um, oh, by the way, Poppy is from Australia, so just for context. Um, okay, I guess so. I don't know. Okay, let's go to someone who designs kitchens, not a uh, fashion designer. Okay, this is a lesson from Dorian Kefal de Fall. I don't know. It's This person is an antiquary. antiquary. I have no idea what that is. That is. And Thomas Deviet, 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 a designer from London. Wow. All right, let's just see here uh, what we can get from these people. Okay, they're talking about stripe. Okay, a galley kitchen. A galley kitchen has only one purpose. But when you trade a chunk of wall space in favor of a seating area, you increase the value of the room. A breakfast, a breakfast and lunch happen here as well as bill paying and household tasks at night. Or at night, Thomas can enjoy wine uh, at the table while Dorian goes. Um, bill paying. Doesn't bill paying just happen on your phone? Um, why does it have to happen at some table? Anyway. Okay, they're talking about stripes here. Let me see. Oh, to make ceramic tile look less buildery, install it vertically. It has a retro swimming pool vibe that feels totally different than the standard horizontal application. I do like the look of horizontally installed tiles. Um, and, and I was never going for the retro swimming pool look, but I do like that look for sure. Try vertical, not horizontal stripes to slow down the eye. Here, the yellow catches the attention, but the orientation of the stripes is actually calming. Horizontal stripes are called racer stripes for a reason. You can weigh in on that. I don't know um, about stripes in the kitchen, um, but let's go to someone else. All right, this is Victoria Sass from Prospect Refuge Studio in Minneapolis. Minneapolis, Minneapolis. okay. All right, make inexpensive materials look luxurious. Show off their best feature by pairing them uh, with a contrasting element, round wood drawer pulls, and glossy paint. You'll notice the loveliness of each element because of what it sits, sits next to. Okay. There's honesty in leaving your toaster out. I like that, that headline. People are obsessed with hiding their small appliances, but it wasn't always like that. In the 1950s, people were proud of their gadgets, and I see that happening again. These homeowners love their fisher Pekel fridge and their toaster oven. It's very come as you are here. little Nirvana throw out. Okay. Um, yeah, I totally, I totally get that. I think uh, appliances that are used daily should be on your countertop because that's where they're used the most. And I don't see it as a big deal to see small appliances. I don't see it as a big deal to have appliance garage either, but sometimes you just limit yourself with an appliance garage is what you can put into it because it is a limited size. And generally you're, you know, if you have a length of run of countertop, that's maybe more than a meter that you can put these things on. That's just generally the way we use kitchens and what's going to happen by just because it's going to happen is you're going to start to use the kitchen in the most convenient way possible. So if you're designing your kitchen to be inconvenient, that's not a good thing. If it's convenient to leave your toaster and your blender and whatever else you use daily out on the countertop, then that's what's going to happen. So plan for it and know that you're probably going to go that route. And if there's appliances that you don't use daily that can be stored away, then plan for that as well. So I thought that was a pretty good, pretty good uh, piece of advice. A statement 
over island light is overrated here we go it puts a lot of pressure on a single item like the, the thing has ptsd aim for interesting moments baked into the rest of the room not spending all the money and energy on one object i think that's a pretty good piece of advice and i don't know what do you think are elaborate pendant lights overrated or is it kind of the one thing that sets your kitchen apart or when you look at a picture of a nice kitchen and you see some very fancy pendant light hanging do you think that it is awesome or maybe not i don't know they're just saying that it's overrated and i think i think the the day of the super elaborate pendant light might be behind us it's like okay we get it you know let's move on maybe you can measure and plan or you can let serendipity take over. Who's serendipity? You say, okay, say you didn't account for your tallest olive oil bottle. You might find yourself in the supermarket researching new olive oils. Maybe find something you love because your house, maybe find something you love because your house sent you here. I don't know what you're talking about there, Victoria. It's just... <laughs> that's too much designer talk for me all right the best colors take more than three words to describe that's a pretty interesting thing a muddy bluish gray or even better when you start using words that aren't color related such as describing a sunset or a storm when you're chasing a thought what are you even talking about okay so the best colors take more than three words to describe or maybe they just don't take any words to describe because they're just the best colors because you like them. But interesting take on that. This is like philosophical kitchen and design talk. I'm not really into that. <laughs> maybe you are, and that's all cool. All right, hardware. Don't discount the cheapos. A lot of brilliant hardware, like simple wood handles, is totally dismissed. Written off because it's $2 a handle. Lots of it is thoughtfully designed and durable. Price is not always an indicator of quality. Don't let the, that stigma get in the way of a great pick. All right, well, maybe if you want something high quality, that's your prerogative. But they're right. Not necessarily everything that is super expensive is good quality either. And anything that is less expensive doesn't have to be cruddy quality. Okay, a good kitchen is a bespoke kitchen. Bespoke means made for you, custom. It means that not everyone will like it. Lots of designed kitchens have the, the stone of the moment. Okay, uh, the cabinet color of the moment. But anyone could live in that house and would, and would like it fine. What's missing is... We know what <laughs> I can't read all of a sudden. What's missing in that sort of home is you. So I, I like the idea of this uh, thought, but basically I think that your kitchen does need to be designed for you specifically. And I think most of us go that route. Do you think? I mean, are you picking materials because you think they're just trendy or do you actually really like them? I think when it comes down to it, most of us pick materials that we like. If they happen to be trendy, that's fine. But that doesn't mean we're trendy and we're just following trends. I think it's okay to like things because we like them. Whether or not if they're trendy or not, like that shouldn't matter. To me, it's like pick the things you like. Who cares if they're trendy or not? Because, yeah, not everyone's going to like whatever you pick anyway. So what's the difference? You have to like it. And that's a very good piece of advice in kitchen design is make sure you design the kitchen for you. Unless you're flipping this house, you're going to sell it next year. Then you want to think about what do most people like? And you can Google that. So, all right. What else does uh, Victoria have to say? Uh, let's go to the next designer. Um, I hope you're liking this. If you do, give it a thumbs up. This is just something different, not something I've done before. But I don't buy a lot of design books. I thought this would be interesting to kind of look at. So. All right, this is Katie Rosenfeld. They sound designer-like. Katie Rosenfeld from Massachusetts. No one uses their second sink. An itty-bitty soapstone sink by the range seemed like a good idea, and it looks great. But that sink gets no use. We don't even fill pots there. 
Once my husband tried to wash chicken or something in there, and I screamed at him. Why are you washing chicken in my decorative sink? What do you think? If you, do, do you have a second sink? Do you use it? A lot of people do request this. I know I have clients that think the idea of having a second sink is a good one if they don't. And this comes up quite a bit in design scenarios, whether it's by a coffee station or for rinsing vegetables and for prep in an island or some other use. Um, having a second sink can be very beneficial. Katie's saying they don't even use it. So I guess that goes into, was this something that you designed thinking, you know, ahead of time, or is it just something you wanted to put in there because you thought it looked cool? All right, you, you've got to make concessions. I think this is a similar one from before. Eat in kitchen or a sitting area. I choose a sitting area. If I had young kids, I probably would have chosen an eat-in kitchen, right? But the kids are grown. Well, I don't know. Aren't they both sitting areas? Or I'm getting like a place to kind of sit down, eat, drink coffee, and have a crumpet. All right. Accommodate for how you cook. <laughs> we cook almost exclusively in Dutch ovens. So my drawers had to hold many, many, I can't say this word, le crusade. No pans, no stainless pots, just those Dutch ovens so the drawers are quite deep and also need very good hardware mechanisms so that they can take the weight of the Dutch ovens. Um, but this is a very good point is to know the way that you cook and accommodate for that. And this is when it comes down to in the design phase, working with your designer to say, here's here are the things I need to store. Instead of just your designer throwing in a bunch of stuff and you figuring out later how to store those things, it's very important that if you have six Dutch ovens, that you accommodate for that in some way, shape, or form. All right, let's see. Uh, oh, this is an interesting one. It's okay to sacrifice storage. Deciding not to use upper cabinets might screw you for storage, but save the spirit of the room. I want it to look at the Toby jugs. I don't even know what they're talking about. Rather than upper cabinets that store a bunch of platters, you have to make choices in life. Uh, well, okay. Yeah, I totally agree. If if uh, It's okay to not use wall cabinets. We talk about it. I talked about it. Uh, many times before, um, we've talked about it on the live stream lots, and I think it's important that um, when you're designing the kitchen, you figure that out. Do I need this, these wall cabinets or not? Can I use less? Do I need them at all? Whatever. And um, and don't just put them there because you think you need to. I think we're, we're turning a corner in design, especially in modern design, where we are more comfortable with the idea of making these kind of bigger changes that, that seem to be non-standard and not having wall cabinets is definitely a non-standard uncommon uh, way to design a kitchen from for many of us and it's becoming more and more acceptable uh, as time goes on all right okay not every sacrifice is justifiable a lot of my choices were aesthetic over function never i wanted that lacanche lacanche range badly. I'm Canadian, but I, I don't speak a lick of French, so I can't say any of these French words. But I could only fit the small, the smallest size, which meant buying new cookware and revising some of my techniques to use a smaller stove. But it looks so good. I mean, you know, th that's where it comes down to designing it for yourself. If you want a really expensive um, range that badly, then that's something you're going to have to figure out. Um, so, you know, to each their own. And I think these people are talking about their personal spaces, by the way, um, which is interesting. All right. This is Shavonda Gardner. Very designs. Oh, and she's a content creator and designer from Sacramento, California. Design it for age, for imperfection. The soapstone counters are nearly indestructible, but they get scratches, and that's okay. The materials here are living materials. They're going to look different over time. That's also why we cook with copper pots. Sorry about my camera. 
The kitchen that feels really used and loved is a happy kitchen. I think this is good common sense advice is that your kitchen is going to be going to be uh, used and worn looking depending on the materials that you choose. And I think that's fine. You just have to know that going into it, that what I'm using is going to be marked up. I have hardwood floor in my kitchen and that hardwood floor was marked up the night we moved in. We drugged the dishwasher over it and part of the dishwasher leg scratched the floor. And I was like, oh, like really, you know, internally, like, uh, that, that really, that really sucks. And my dad said, well, it's just, gonna, it's just a memory, it's just a story now. So don't worry about it. I was like, that's a really great way of looking at it. Like, who cares? Like, it's, you got to know going into it that these things are going to, something's going to happen. So, so that's a good piece of advice. All right. An island is a workspace. A table is communal. An island is for a temporary gathering. It says, come and sit here while I'm working. But when I'm done, we'll get up and go to the table. When I talk about islands, I do talk about the fact that they don't need to just have seating all the time. We can abandon that in some cases. Sometimes it feels super forced. Sometimes it's not comfortable. Sometimes it's just not done right at all. And that that's fine. If you're going to have seating in your island, do make it comfortable. But this is an interesting piece of advice. Yeah, we're not, we don't necessarily gather around the island for comfortable seating. We gather around it because it's we're not going to be there very long, hopefully, unless you're a kid and you can sit there forever. All right, make your guests feel something. A space is working when people walk in and sense the people who live there must have a really cool story. Maybe they feel uneasy or amazing, but everyone feels something. Well, hopefully they're not feeling uneasy in your kitchen. Uh, that wouldn't be very good, but uh, that probably has more to do with you and your presence and less to do with your cabinets. Okay, it's okay to seek a reaction. I definitely wanted a response from friends such as, holy crap. That's cool. Or where'd you get that? Or are your cabinets and stove actually burgundy? I mean, whatever. I'm not even going to say anything about that. All right, let's see what else I have to say. Forget square footage. Don't give that number so much power. A small space gives you so many opportunities. Stop thinking numbers. Instead, think about the feeling or experience you're going for not just how to maximize the space. Okay, but make sure you maximize the space too, because that's the whole point in a kitchen. But definitely don't abandon the feel and you know how it's going to look. I mean, I think there's good balance there. And if you're just caught up in the square footage, <clears throat> excuse me, you can be maybe saddened by the fact that you can't have all the things in your kitchen that um, maybe you wanted to. All right. Let's see. Live in your space. Listen to it. <laughs> then ask yourself, how can I recreate it in a way that feels natural to the time it was built? I'm not going to keep reading that. Let's go to someone else. Thanks, Shavonda. Jessica Rhodes, designer and blogger from New York. All right. Let's see, Jessica. Here's something that's that's been said before. Upper cabinets. Take them down. It was the obvious first move. There were upper cabinets over the sink that didn't even reach the ceiling. Take them down. Give the space a room-like feel. It felt freer right away. When you take down a wall or take down obtrusiveness in your kitchen, like cabinets like that, it does feel bigger. It's visually bigger, physically bigger because you, there's less you know stuff on the wall. So that, that could be a good idea. Again, paired with the fact that it is designed correctly so that all the other stuff can fit in there. All right, do drawers, not shelves. It's something everyone tells you to do because low shelves are unloved. Accumulate unused things and are a pain to access. I mean, this is just common sense design. If you're going to have a base cabinet, it should be accessible. And it's only really going to be accessible if it has drawer or pullout. Unless, like I say, it has some very specific use case that you've planned for. And then, you know, by all means, do whatever you're going to do. All right, visible appliances are honest. I like the sound of this one. Seeing a fridge or a toaster is no different than seeing a TV on the living room wall. It's just the way we live. The, ultra, oh, the, the utilitarian mixed with the beautiful, that contrast is what makes it special. And, you know, 
not everybody likes paneled appliances and not everybody, like I said, wants their small appliances in an appliance garage hidden. The key is some of us like looking at our dishwasher and have, don't have any problem with the fact that it's not paneled. Like it's not even a thing. It's not a thought. It's like, yeah, that's a dishwasher. Like what's the big deal? Yes. That's the fridge. Yes. It's stainless, you know, so who cares? So just, it's okay. It's all good. It's like the TV. It's on the wall, like the fridge. There it is. You don't panel your television, but you can, it can look very nice. And if you do like to do that, by all means, go for it. I'm not saying you shouldn't, or you should just, if you don't, it's okay too. But where you can be pretty, do exposed tools like pots, pans, storage baskets are useful and a chance to, to display beautiful objects. You need things like dustpan and brush anyway, so you might as well get a wood one that looks uh, nice. Sure, I mean, I, you might as well. Okay, <laughs> curtains in the kitchen, why not? I think some of you have something to really think about in this one because I don't know if curtains are, are loved by all, so... Oh, uh, where, where was this at? I'm, I'm reading it. Where to go? Curtains. Oh, yeah. Curtains soften the space, make it feel decorative, and truly give a feel uh, of the room, not a work. Oh, it truly gives the room a feel, not a workspace. I guess so. Um, oh, maybe I'll have to show you this one here. Let me just switch over to this little camera for a second so I can show you. Hold on. Just, just, just bear with me. Maybe you can see it there. See how above, um, yeah, see above the fridge, right? Where are we at? Right oh, I'm in my camera. So right there. See that right there? Interesting. See that over, oh, froze right over there. Above the range, curtains there instead of doors. I don't know. That's that's a stretch for me. I don't know if that's, if that, I don't know. I don't know, Jessica, what you're, what you're doing there with all those curtains. But anyway, to each their own. All right, let's go to the next designer. This is, this is kind of fun. I like some of these. And I don't like some of them, so it's all good. All right. Um, this is Casey, Ken Casey Kenyon, designer from New York City. All right. Let go of some dreams. <laughs> you want a dream kitchen? Time to let go of some stuff. The homeowner lobbied for an L-shaped sofa, uh, but it would have cut off the space. The elegant solution is chairs and a sofa with ottomans, much more flexible. I guess in the design of the kitchen, you have to be able to say, okay, there's certain things that I want and certain things are just, you know, we can chat about them. Maybe they're not going to work and you got to be okay with that. Use old stuff to make it feel less catalog. A modern catalog is an art form, but it's not great for living. Okay. It doesn't have soul. Creating the soul or spirit of the place is what the home design is about i guess so all right put adjacent rooms to work nearby at the top of the stairs is an old desk chair that can be carried downstairs to add seating uh it was put there intentionally to be at the ready okay well that's kind of interesting use nearby rooms to help the kitchen to dining area grow or shrink as needed so that's kind of common sense you know if you have company over you got that extra table or extra bunch of chairs you bring them in so you know common sense there i think uh doo -doo -doo -doo. Ooh, be hyper specific. It's in, in such a small kitchen, function is key. The ledge above the sink was designed to just be uh, deep enough to place a grocery bag. So, I guess in the you know design phase, it is important to just think about all those spaces and how you're using them, and um, design it with intention. Designing with intention, I think, is very very important. All right. How's everyone doing? I haven't been in the chat at all. So let's just take a second and I'll just look through here to see if what everybody's saying. Um, and uh, I don't know if you have any questions. I know you're probably just chatting with each other or commenting on some of these things, which is cool. And um, I appreciate you being in the, in the chat, of course. And uh, yeah, cool. Nick says, how many Dutch ovens do you need? Right. I have one one dutch oven and i don't need one <laughs> no interesting uh i think australian kitchen designs are so behind 
than anywhere else in the world. I wonder why. Or oh, is that true? Um, is it, are they d behind? <laughs> Kurds, no, just stop reading Jessica's stuff. <laughs> She had a couple of good things to say, but the curtains are like, yeah, I don't know. That's a little bit too designy, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like you're trying too hard with the curtains. I think that's the thing. It's like we get it, we get it that Rachel had it in Friends, but that doesn't mean you need to have it. Question from Bozana. Uh, hi from Karen's Australia. Hey, what do you think of Alpha System? as the main statement piece in a kitchen alpha i don't think because um i don't know anything about it i'd have to look at i have to look at that helen standing up for her australian friends uh what australia isn't behind well not you helen because you have no wall cabinets so you're very much ahead of the curve but maybe other parts are I think if anybody's behind, it's Canada. <laughs> I'll have to look at Alpha. I don't know uh, much about it, to be honest. Is it something I should know about? A kitchen designer, everyone's probably like, you don't know what this is? I don't know. I'll, I'll look that up. I'll look that up in a little bit. All right, let's go on to Agnes Rud Rudzite, a designer in Riga, Latvia. Wow. All right, design with your fingertips. Consider the sense of touch and color at the same time. Sensual materials like stone and wood, materials that are eternal, that age well, sometimes take a long time to create, but are worth it. Yeah, I guess so. Is it just me or is a lot of this stuff like, I don't know. <laughs> it's just not me, I guess. I'm not touchy-feely when it comes to this stuff. There are no wrong colors. I like that. All colors are good. It just depends where they appear and in which combination. Yeah. <laughs> the space gives you the clues of what color it should be. It could be the location or the view from the window. Something will tell you. Hopefully an interior designer will tell me because I have no idea. Uh, let's see. Always have balance of shapes. Okay, this is something designer-like. And not just square and linear, something round. I love when a room doesn't read as very masculine or very feminine. An interior where you can't guess straight away who's living there. If the mood is soft and fluffy and powdery, I'll add something more harsh to balance it. <laughs> Agnes, what are you going on about? <laughs> anyway, get, get something wrong. To achieve playfulness in a space, you need something that doesn't fit in, something off. Think of a beautiful person with everything in place, a god or a goddess. They're intimidating. <laughs> oh my gosh. A small imperfection makes someone even more attractive. <laughs> in the same way with interiors, you have to make the beauty personal. Oh, I love this designer talk. It's so hilarious. All right, Nate McBride is an architect in Maine. Okay. <laughs> it's a room first, a kitchen second. With a, a successful design, you don't walk in and say, ah, here is the kitchen. I don't know. Maybe you do. But rather, here is a room I want to be in. There are lots of elements that signal kitchen. Big one is is upper cabinets. What in the world? You know, Sophie, next book you write, just reach out. I'd love to do one of these pages. I, I would love to do one of these pages for you. Maybe I'll write my own page for the like 2.0 version of this book. And um, that, that, that would be interesting. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, you don't want to walk into the kitchen and be like, oh, here's the kitchen. You, you want to be in a room. I get, I guess so. It's so philosophical, some of these things. Okay, small kitchens are more efficient than larger kitchens. Ooh, okay, that's a statement. If you truly love cooking, you don't want to move around in a big space. Chefs like to have everything where they need within a step or two. 
If you can put that storage elsewhere, you can create an intimate kitchen experience. Large kitchens are part vanity, part excess storage. So shame on all of you who have big, large kitchens, okay? Shame. By the way, my video on this Saturday is all about small kitchens, big function. So Nate will love it. If you believe cooking is communion, you'll want to be in conversation with whomever else is in the house, not sequestered off. That doesn't mean the island needs a sink or a range, but it does necessitate a place for a non-cook to sit. Possibly. But yes, an island without a sink or a range, that's the way to do it. Okay, and then they go on to say, an island sink or cooktop can be limiting. The central surface, be it island or table, should be a space where anyone can come and drink and chop and read and just be. Okay, I like it. Okay, oh, here's something interesting. A lesser, a lesser used material um, that works well near a cooktop is zinc. It's lesser used probably for a reason. <laughs> You can put hot pans directly on it. It has a nice patina that feels like it's been with the house for a long time. Go get your zinc. All right, bottom freezers only. I agree, actually. You can see everything in the freezer where when you look down, freezers on top means you have to bend down to see everything in the fridge. I, I, and Nate, I agree with you. Bottom freezers only. If you're buying a fridge, bottom freezer, definitely the way to go. No granite, please. It's the most functional but aesthetically it has virtually no character are we talking about granite it says no granite it's the most functional but aesthetically it has virtually no character really granite i thought granite was like i mean i don't know it's uniform and not at all mysterious and its affordability makes it the go-to choice for developers, so it's everywhere. It's what everyone's kitchen looks like, which means it's not idiosyncratic enough to be your stone. Wood countertops need maintenance, but they're warm and accessible. Okay, I think there's an argument to be had here on whether or not granite has virtually no character in comparison to wood countertops. I would say they're, they're the very least equally in the, have equal character. And depending on the granite you choose, could have way more character than wood. I think you got that one wrong. The truth about design media and social media. They feature houses but what we live in are homes. That's very true. We do. Oh, here's something interesting. Uh, consider wall-mounted plumbing fixtures. They save counter space and make sink areas cleaner uh, and easier to clean. That's not something we see very often anymore. Definitely was something in the past that people used in their homes was wall-mounted fixtures for their plumbing, for their sink. And um, if you go into any, you know, big box store where most people are are buying uh, their uh, faucets, you're not going to see a lot of options for this. So it's something that definitely isn't um, super popular. But there is a point there to be had. Um, maybe installing them on your wall is a good idea. All right, this is where was a uh, where was old Nate from? He was from Maine, right? Okay. This is Robin Henry, a designer from Westport, Connecticut. All right, let's see. All right, let's see, let's see, let's see. All right. Uh, all right, you don't have to do everything at once. If you have the luxury of poking around, starting with one proje project and moving to another, who knows what will come about? Try something and see how it changes the room. You might keep going or you might pause happily. You don't need full vision, just a place to start. Well, maybe if you're decorating your living room, but I think in a kitchen design scenario, I, I, I think it's important that you do have an end goal in mind and 
don't just go with the flow necessarily and see where you end up because you'll probably end up in, in a bad place. You should have a really clear cut plan. However, everyone's design philosophy is different how they approach these things. So I know, I'm, you know, I'm making fun at some of these things, but you know, they, they all have their approach. They're in the book for a reason. No one called me about the book. So, uh, you know, who, who, what am I to say? Begin with whatever you can't stand. For me, it was the pink granite countertops with backsplash. I mean, that's character. Even after we removed the backsplash, we had a green drywall backsplash for a year. It was better than that bad stone. I guess so. Disguises don't work. Be true to your kitchen. I tried to go all modern in mine, but we live in a burn. <laughs> it's just not believable. It must be a burn demonium. Don't try to make it something it's not. Move it forward. Make it for today, but don't reinvent it. I guess so. Go slow with the process. The cabinets were first painted with a same pale blue color on the walls. But when it was clear the room would take a deeper, braver color, we changed course. Allowing ourselves... Okay, so, I mean, they're just going with that first thing. They're just kind of going slow. Uh, okay, they're talking about cork floors. I don't know if I want to hear about that or not. Cork <laughs> floor tiles are per aren't perfect, but they are wonder but they are wonderful. Cork is natural, soft, and warm under your feet. If your floors aren't perfectly smooth, the thin cork surface can be uneven, but it's not bothersome. So interesting take on cork flooring. Uh, let's see. Uh, hardware should be small and simple. Big fussy hardware is unnecessary in a kitchen. 95% of the time, hardware should be a detail, not a focal point. I, I kind of agree, but sometimes... It is the look. It, it kind of makes the look. It sort of depends. But yeah, I'm not a fan of ultra big hardware. I mean, I've said before on the channel that I just like, you know, just kind of the basic standard size. I don't like anything ultra, ultra huge. Um, all right, all right, all right. Let's see. Banquettes are limiting. You can use regular furniture in the kitchen. Several designer friends suggest a corner banquette for mine. And it could have been nice, but it's also more limiting and permanent than just using a regular old sofa. When you opt for built-ins, you lose spontaneity that comes with moving things around. I do agree with that. You got to be careful on when you're putting in things that you know you don't want to remove because they do cost a lot of money. And uh, having things that you can change out in this regard might be something that's uh, worth it. Again, a banquette is kind of the ancillary part of the kitchen. It's not the main functioning part. Um, so I think in the main functioning parts of your kitchen, it's more important to really plan through those things and because uh, they most likely will be permanent. Okay, let's go to the next designer. Let's see who they are. Epi Thompson, artist and entrepreneur from London and Yorkshire, UK. All right, let's see. I mean, this is where all the good stuff happens anyway. For cluttered people, skip the island. The more surfaces you have, the more room there is to accumulate clutter. An island didn't work for our family. It was full of rubbish and in the center of the room. With a big dining table, you can put the clutter to one side when you need to use it. Yeah, I guess so. Um, this is where knowing your habits really is important, and knowing that, uh, you know, if if you know if if you're prone to that, then that's good. Um, so I guess you got to make that decision based on that. But uh, if you can learn to be uncluttered, maybe that would, might help. Um, I don't know. I think an island is usually a good idea when it when it's when it fits the room, and to not just have an island because you're you're a cluttery mess. I don't know. Is that the right reason? All right. White cabinets are in stock and cheaper. Ooh, but they don't have to stay white. In London, mine are painted with a primer meant to coat the laminate exteriors, such as a Zinsser bin primer, and which I don't even know you can buy anymore. This book is in 2023, by the way, so it's fairly new. And then a hard-wearing latex paint color matched to an iconic India yellow. And there are new handles. Okay. So I guess they're saying you can buy white cabinets cheaply and paint them. But also remember that if you're buying inexpensive cabinets, there's more to the cabinets than color that is probably inexpensive. So you have to be careful with that. All right. 
counter height work tables solve problems. Interesting. A high table is a good project table for cutting and sewing and also food prep. There's a right height and there's a wrong height. And so if you're going to use something that's the right height, it should be counter height. It doesn't necessarily should be a high bar table or something lower like a regular dining table. If you're going to be using it for kitchen related tasks, then it should be at counter height. I can't, uh, this one, this guy, this person, sorry, Epi, I don't know. Okay. A rug tells you to sit and stay a while. At my mom's, everyone wants to sit near the warm uh, aga, aga cooker. The chair and the rug nearby tells them that they're welcome to do that. You don't want to sit in a place that feels like someone is going to wipe up before and after you. Interesting. Some of these things are very interesting. <sighs> okay. All right, well, that's enough from you, Epi. Let's go to someone else. <laughs> I didn't screen, no, I didn't screen any of this stuff in advance. I I, 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 I read the first page. <laughs> Create your, it's better this way. It's just more, you know, it's more me anyway. Create your own warm light. Paint colors and light work together to create uh, feeling or mood in a room. And there are colors that mimic warm light, such as peach yellow. There you go. Okay, who's this? Laurel Concelio Broughton, designer from Los, Los Angeles. Okay, let's see. What else? Mm. Okay, new houses need old house tricks. Green is the theme in this space. But the green vintage bathroom sink, green tile, and green formica cabinets don't match per se. And that's intentional. It makes them come off a little less planned. The idea is to let the different materials be themselves and to not be too color coordinated. Just the way matching shoes and a blouse would be a bit dorky. I guess. I don't know. Okay, Laurel, we're moving on from you. <laughs> Liz McPhail, designer from Austin, Texas. Okay, let's see what Austin has to say. Ask, what can we keep? People go around renovations the wrong way. They instinctively look for what they want to change. Mm. Instead, ask what's worth salvaging, restoring, and keeping and moving into another room. I think this is good advice overall. We talked about this earlier. We talked about it before. Is just knowing what is good in your kitchen and that wants to, you want to stay. Knowing what you can keep. Knowing what's, what's going to be functional that's already functional now. It's going to be functional later for you. And knowing that you are going to fall into your old habits in your new kitchen. Um, so, you know, what can you keep can be good. Add only what's necessary. Don't subscribe to musts. Your room needs only, your rooms need only what they need. Here, we needed a garbage disposal. No one ever volunteers to clean the drain catch, but not a working, but not a working stove because it's in an office. All right. Uh, there is a new conventional plug in the refrigerator, but no ice machine because it wasn't 100% necessary. We can make ice. Well, I'm not designing a kitchen for an office, so let's keep going. All right. Use it up, wear it out, make it do, or do without. A famous World War II slogan was top of mind here. The cabinets were kept and painted. The interiors wallpapered. And the glass fronts were added to increase the feeling of openness. So let's move on to something more useful. Oh, here's something I disagree with the title of. Okay, a table is an island. I just talked about this and more. A table in the kitchen gives you the that thing we all want, a connection to the kitchen as a social gathering place. The kitchen does bring us together, whether it's for cooking or doing some homework with your kids. And there's an intimacy to the dining table that works for all of us. Well, I agree with that 100%, but, you're, but the title says the table is an island and more. And a table is not an island. And... I don't think you should put a table in instead of an island if an island is going to be useful for your kitchen. A table is a table. It's at table height for a reason. Yes, you do homework there and you eat there and it's comfortable for doing table things, but not for doing kitchen work. So no islands, thanks. I don't like sitting at an island to eat. Nobody does. Counter stools are functional 
uh, and convenient for informal dining, like for breakfast and for a drink. But I think we've gone too far on the kitchen island. Well, I agree with you, Liz McPhail, designer from Austin, Texas, on this one. I, I do agree with you there. I think we've gone too far with the kitchen island. My camera does too. And I think it's time that we rethink the way we use our islands and just be honest and let the room talk to us. Let it speak to our souls about how we want to use the space. Let's move on. Let's see. We got a few more and we're almost done. I hope you guys aren't super bored with this and uh, something a little different for this live stream than what we normally do. All right, this is Rob Ashford and Kevin Ray from New York. Ooh, one's a choreographer and a producer. The other's a design exec. All right, I'll see what they have to say. Okay, well, not too bad. Okay, major cooks need major hoods. If you want to sear, to fry, to cook at high heat, you want the smoke and odors to be pulled out. And that requires a powerful hood. This hood is not for show. It's not a statement piece like in some kitchens. It's here to do a job. So I wonder what kind of hood they have. Maybe I'll show you. Can I see it? Can I find it here? If we look, kind of. Here, I'll show you what it looks like. I mean, it fits into the space. Let me change my camera view. Uh, see it there? There you go. Look at that. Big old industrial looking hood. So, I mean, that's fine. I totally agree that your hood should be there for the purpose of ventilating the space and getting rid of all that stuff that needs to be gotten rid of to the outside world. And, and there should be no other conversation about that. Just get it vented, whether it's pretty or not. Edit your belongings for the space you have. Here, there was only narrow space for putting a fridge freezer. We figured better to unbundle it so we have tall, thin fridge and a separate freezer drawer. All right. So that's just using the room and then designing to, to the room. Oh, ooh. This the next one's good. Lamps are warm and homey. Even in this small kitchen, there are two lamps. The first thing on in the evening and the last off. After the room is cleaned and everything is put away, it feels uh, so inviting to go back into the lamp lit to get a glass of water or something. It's a very different feeling uh, than overhead light. The lamp thing is interesting. We talked about it before. Um, and Jackie loves the lamp thing too. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Are you with Jackie or are you with Rob and Kevin with their lamp? Um, I'm not a lamp lamp guy, but I think it just gets dusty and it's got to be cleaned. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's definitely a, a trendy thing. So, all right, let's see what else they have to say. <laughs> I love the philosophical talk here. Okay. Entering a good kitchen is like walking into someone's comforting arms. Oh, my word. When the house glows, it has a pleasant aroma. When the atmosphere is welcoming and warm, that's what you aim for. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. It's only time for a new kitchen when you've exhausted all your options. Or if you've saved up for 10 years and it's your dream to have a new one. If you've lived there for years and been creative with your choices and you will say, there's more I want to do here, then it's time to play with a new set of options. Yeah, I disagree. I mean, if your kitchen's dysfunctional, it's horrible and you, it, it's got to be changed, then it's got to be changed. And there's nothing wrong with that. All right, Rodman. Primick, a designer from Tennessee. Okay. Oh, let's see what else we have to hear. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Calibrate your design. Okay. When well, the kitchen is, ooh, grounding. Oh, they're talking about grounding. Interesting. Okay. Minimize the number of materials you use. Don't you don't need forty different materials and details. You can mellow it down to a few special materials. Don't fall into the trap because you can afford it. That you should do it. It's true. I mean, very true. But again, I think intrinsically we're designing things for ourselves that we like anyway. And if, if, if we like 40 different materials, then 
then we do like it. So, all right, let's see. Uh, a cotton rug is a is cozy and nice. Wash wash it for years, and when it's worn, replace it. Again with the rugs. Oh, here we go. Let purpose drive the material. Okay. Chopping a lot? Do a butcher block counter. Stainless steel is good because you can use it. Beat it up and it still looks good. Avoid materials that are hard to work with and hard to replace. Like uninteresting granite. Your kitchen shouldn't drive you crazy. This is really good advice is to pick materials that you can use and that are usable. And um, so, yeah, definitely go with that. All right, let's go to the next person. We got a, only a few more. I can cut this off anytime if you're bored. Uh, James Coviello, Coviello, upstate New York. Autopilot renovations are a disaster. You'll visit a house and get a tour, and the host will say, Well, the kitchen was redone in 1997, so it's due for an update. But why? Does it need to be updated? Or can just the appliances be updated? So many kitchens are built in a way that if you touch one thing, you have to touch everything. True. But that doesn't have to be. You can make incremental improvements. Well, this is true. I think if you have a good solid layout that works, then there's things you can do in your kitchen instead of redoing the whole thing that can make sense. For instance, in 1997, if your if your kitchen was redone then, you probably don't have a lot of big drawer banks or pullouts in your base cabinets. And those are things that can be easily added to any cabinet, whether it's framed with a center style or whether it's frameless. These are probably 1997 cabinets that are framed. So it's still very possible to add these things without changing doors or anything like that. There's ways to do it. And there's probably time to upgrade your countertop, which can be done if your layout is good. But I don't recommend making major changes like that because I do think they're major because they cost money. If the layout really does need to be updated and changed uh, to be to be better, but a, a good, old, good that's good overall advice. All right. There's no reason in the world to buy a new uh, a, a new sink. There are so many beautiful old sinks out there in the world. If you're okay with a classic or vintage aesthetic, they're not mechanical. They're just vessels. So they can be easily plumbed and brought back to life. I agree. I think that's good advice. There's nothing wrong with a new sink, or there's nothing wrong with not having a new sink. Just do whatever you want. It's easy to change an unfitted kitchen, but not realistic because most of us are not designing kitchens this way or having them unfitted. In my kitchen, the only sink. It, only the sink would stay in its place, and that's because of the waistline. Everything else in the kitchen could just be removed or rearranged in a single day. Definitely not something that most people um, are going to be doing. Thank you, James. Moving on to Meta Coleman, designer from Utah. Kitchen, ooh, I, I like this. A kitchen has to be a workhorse, but also a show pony. That was a request from a client, and it gets... And it gets at the truth. Kitchens are fun to create and also really hard to design. You have to create so much function, but also make it feel special. I think that's a very honest thing that they said here. Um, yeah, I totally agree with that. I think I think that's, that's good. All right, uh, let's see. It's a home, not a showroom. A bookcase with three books, an object, and then a vase is just not realistic. Who collects three books? Of course, it's about curating, collecting, and adding layers, but you should also be true to how you live. Very good advice because you are going to fall into your old habits anyway. So, yeah, be, be true to yourself and how you actually use the space. There are lots of ways to do things, but being overly controlled isn't a good one. It doesn't amount to anything really beautiful, but when you allow the process to happen and you lean into the imperfections and the challenges, the outcome is better than if you control everything. The hardest challenges sometimes turn out to be the best outcomes. I like some of this person's uh, lessons here. Okay, kitchen design strategy. All right. First, think about what you want to achieve in that space or what kinds of things you want to happen in that room. And then it's on to problem solving. 
listing the problems and figuring out how to make them go away. That's really good advice. This is my favorite one so far. Uh, I haven't read all of them yet here, but so far, that's really good advice. Uh, yeah. I mean, you just you just pick at, pick away at problems, make them go away. It doesn't get any simpler than that. That's kitchen design uh, in a nutshell. Okay. The, a secret design element is the orientation of the space and the available light. This house was dark. Most of the windows are obstructed by trees, so it gets green light. It needed more warmth from the colors inside, so there's a yellowy white paint. Okay, interesting, interesting. Uh, ooh. When shopping for lighting, think function. Over a dining table, you want a cozy mood, so it needs to be low, but you also want it softly diffused because you don't want the bulb shining in your face. Very good advice. But you got to think, you've got to think about that. Go a bit lower for a pendant over the island, too. Interesting. I like uh, I like what Meta is saying. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's keep going. Oh, here's here's an interesting one that that they're saying: shop appliances in person. You can't do this online. You have to get out there and touch and feel and look in order to get the sense of how you'll like living with it. You should ask yourself: How do I cook? Who does the cooking? And how do I entertain? Exposure helps you get a firm idea of what you like. Yeah, don't go online and buy your appliances. Um, go and look at them in the store. All right, Chris Mottolini, Chris Mottolini, upstate New York. Okay, they're a photographer. Only got a few more. It's three more to go. We're almost done. Then, then I'll be done with this book. <laughs> you don't need a backsplash. It's true. Here, I didn't feel right to tile over the texture of the plastered walls. And we didn't need to every now and then you wash the walls. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Sure. Gas is over. Eventually, we'll get rid of the gas stove for environmental reasons and for the benefit of the respiratory health of my family. Very interesting. And yeah, very controversial, uh, Chris, that you'd say that because many of you love your gas ranges. Many of you are looking at going with induction. Many of you still have electric, like me, and we have our opinions and thoughts about that. Uh, so they're saying gas is over. All right. Uh, da, 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 let's see. Oh, here we go. Kids, dog, and island is too many. Okay. There's enough happening in the room already. It didn't make sense to have an island interrupt the flow of the space here. Well, that, that comes down to the design of the space and whether an island fit. Um, you know, just put the dog outside, get an island, no big deal. Helma Bong, 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 I can't even say her last name. She's a cookbook author and host from Amsterdam. All right, you have to. Okay, let's see what they're saying. Something worth spending on a cooker. A good range is essential, make it functional and beautiful. Okay, remember, a kitchen is a living space. That's why it's important to make it into something beautiful and lively. The tend toward dark gray is so gloomy and boring. Neat cupboard interiors are overrated. Instead, what about keeping your collection to a color scheme and letting it all stack up? I don't know what you're talking about, Helmut. Let's go to the last one. No, two more, two more. This is M.K. Quinlan, a designer and shop owner from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, ample counter space is overhyped. <laughs> ample counter, not, not excessive, ample counter space is overhyped. There's a fear out there that without an island, there won't be enough counter space. You don't need it as much as you think you do. Not sure how I feel about that. <sighs> Let's see. Dishwashers. Oh, dish drawers. What? Dish drawers. Do it. Okay, sorry. I thought it was a dishwashers. It's preferable to pull a heavy stack of plates or bowls from a lower versus balancing them from a high cabinet. There's reasons dish drawers became popular. I totally agree, MK, on this one. Definitely put all your dishes in a drawer 
it's the only real way to go. Uh, totally agree. All right. Um, let's see. Help kids be autonomous in the kitchen. There are drawers intentionally, so make it kitchen kid friendly. I get it. Uh, what else can we say? Separate the stovetop from the oven. It opens up a whole world. There's a wide, shallow drawer of giant utensils right under the burner, and all the dishes in the drawers under that. The pot lids are there too, right where they need to be. There is a, uh, a you know, a, a functional aspect to separating your range top and your oven if you have the space for it. I think having a wall oven is a great idea because it puts it at a very convenient height for most people. And um, so, yeah, if you have the room for something like that, it, it's definitely something you should think about, but not, you know, not automatic. All right, let's go to the last one. Then we'll be done with this book. Justina Blake, Blakeney, designer, author, and founder of Jungalo, Southern California. Uh, let's see. I'll just read one of yours because they don't look that great. <laughs> um, okay. How to create a personal kitchen. What are your rituals and your family rituals? Drinking tea all day long is one of mine. So we did the instant hot water tap. Jason, whoever that is, is big on making soups and stews. So there's a pot filler. We are both big coffee drinkers, so we have a dedicated space for that morning ritual. And we love to host, so we're expecting the house to often be full of people, and we want them to feel comfortable enough to help themselves so there's a beverage station. We're done with that book. That was an interesting uh, take on some design philosophies from different designers, something different for the live stream for sure um and i hope fully uh if you didn't see the book here i thought i just seen something there if you didn't see the book it was mentioned at the beginning but uh, it's an interesting book i i do like it it's called um uncommon kitchens by sophie donaldson you can get it at anywhere books are sold and um i'll put a link to it in in the description later on if anyone's watching this and wants to buy it from there from amazon um yeah so I think it's it's a you know pretty pretty interesting book and uh, you get to see some different perspectives and of course everybody's take on these things is different. Obviously, I'm not very philosophical in the way I approach these things. Uh, I'm I'm more about function and designing it that way, but that doesn't mean there's not a space for that you know flow, uh, if you will. And so if you're in that river, by all means, just float around. But uh, when I'm designing a kitchen, I do want it to be super functional. And so I looked at some of these things, especially when you're looking at the pictures that you can kind of get ideas. And, and then we do that on the, on the live all the time. We look at some of these pictures and get just this sense of things that we would want to put in our kitchen or different ideas and things we can incorporate into our kitchen. So no matter if it's an elaborate kitchen or, you know, small kitchen, big kitchen, whatever, I think it's good for us to uh, to see some of these things and get different people's perspective is always good too. Um, I have now been reminded as to why I don't read <laughs> design books. There, I saved you. I saved you some some money on a book. Okay, Jackie, thanks. Uh, question from Bozana: What do you think on ceiling fans in kitchens? I am not a fan of ceiling fans at all, at all. Um, I mean, Jackie's yours is a little different. It's not a traditional ceiling fan. So you can go to Jackie's channel and check out her ceiling fan. Um, by all means do that. But, um, otherwise I, I, I'm not a fan of ceiling fans in any room, not just a kitchen. I think they're just dust collectors and, and they don't really look that good. Uh, except for Jackie's is a little different. It's, it's not your regular uh, one. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just giving my opinion, and I'm, I guess I'm just opinionated on that particular thing. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, Vonda, I like the era, the, the era, I guess, what you mean to say, of design that we are in, or maybe error. <laughs> Anything goes. People can like what they like. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, you have to design the kitchen for you, and that's what's really important. I, I've been saying that for a long time, and... Uh, you know, that, that's what it really comes down to. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I get you. I, I don't live in the South. 
And um, you might be absolutely right about that. So they're mandatory in the South. Okay. Hey, Jeanette, Vancouver. Sweet. Thanks for being here. Uh, I know that we're watching from all over. And so it's great to, um, when someone can say hi, especially if they're first time in the live. So appreciate you joining. Uh, let's see. So, you know, let's see. I'm just looking through the chats here, guys. We're going to take off in a little bit. So ceiling fans, I guess, are a thing in the South. Uh, but wouldn't AC be just as equally a thing? Do you need to have a fan if you have AC? Helga. I live in the South, and I do not like ceiling fans either. Well, there you go. <laughs> Hit the thumbs up. Hit the thumbs up. I, I, I'm not looking, so I don't know how many we have or don't have. Love to have the thumbs up. <laughs> Great fun, eh, Mark? But some of these designers aren't psychedelics. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. I think you're right about that. It's just, I just find sometimes it's just a little too much, you know? And I'm not trying to be mean to them. I'm not, I'm not, you know, they, they're very successful. I'm sure. I just think, um, it gets a little too touchy feely, you know, but yeah, you need them with AC Terry Joe. Well, Terry, you'd know in Florida. Um, okay. But back to the ceiling fan in the kitchen thing. I, I don't like it. Not just the South. You have to go to the dirty South for fans and fly strips. Now that's authentic kitchen. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's no need for a ceiling fan where I live. I mean, for two weeks in the summer, maybe. But we have AC for that. In the winter, ceiling fans can push warm air down, especially in a room with 10-foot high ceilings. Well, I see I hit a nerve with the ceiling fans, which is good. I love hitting nerves. By It's always good to hit a nerve. <laughs> ceiling fans are a must- that being said, not only ceiling fans are created equal. Some are just hideous. Definitely need ceiling fans in some parts of Australia. You know what, folks? I wish I needed a ceiling fan. Maybe someday I will if I lived in a warm place. But I don't right now. So when that day comes, I'll consider the ceiling fans and I'll consider putting them in my kitchen and I'll put them everywhere. I think you should ask AI to repair a kitchen plan based on the book you just read. That's a great idea. It's a really good idea. I'm glad, Mark. I guess <laughs> I guess we'll be friends. We survived the OTR gate. <laughs> we have the ceiling fan debacle. Well, I said yours yours was different. Yours is yours is a different one altogether. Um, but yeah, you know. Uh we, we can be friends, even though. All right. <laughs> I'm getting ceiling fan recommendations now. Look at the Aqua V2 DC IP66 rated ceiling fan with remote. Matte black, six, 70 inch by Hunter Pacific with light. Great anywhere. We love our Nova Scotia climate down here in Europe, not in Cape Breton. No, we don't love her. Uh, yeah, we loves the heat. I love the heat. Okay, not a fan of ceiling fans in the kitchen, but like in the bedroom, I use it regularly. I must be missing out on the ceiling fan thing. When I was a kid, I had a ceiling fan in my bedroom. Um, one of my favorite activities was taking my rolled up socks or my GI Joe figures or anything and throwing and putting the ceiling fan on high speed and throwing the socks or things into the ceiling fan and just letting them fly across the room. So 
yeah, definitely ceiling fan recommended for that. Uh, but in the kitchen, I just don't like it. I think it's just a kind of a dust collector. But again, you know, I'm going to stop talking about ceiling fans. But it is fun if you've never, th I mean, we're all adults here, mostly, probably, likely. And um, if you have a ceiling fan, I just, I want you to do that. You've probably done it when you were a kid if you had ceiling fans. But if not, just, just take your, your take a pair of socks, a light pair of socks. Just toss them up there. Just have fun with it. <laughs> Dedicated ceiling fan in design analysis video. I think I just get a lot of bad comments from people saying that they don't they don't like what I'm saying. Wow. When my son was eight, he decided to swing from the ceiling fan in the bedroom, jump from my bed, cause a small fire fun times. <laughs> Holy smokes. I never tried that. I knew. I knew like this isn't gonna hold anybody, but socks it'll it'll crush. Anyway, that, that's hilarious. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah, move over, OTR gate. It's the ceiling fans now. Um, too funny. <laughs> my GF Joe, my GI Joes have gone to war. Too much. Well, this has been fun, guys. Uh, I've got an open plan in the living area kitchen, Jason. It would be perfect. Thanks for this recommendation. I'll mull it over. I guess we're moving ceiling fans now. All good. Yep, you did. You totally uh, you brought on something here. I can't get out of. I can't dig my way out of this one. But um, anyway, I, I, you know. Get a ceiling fan, I guess. You can you can check this book out if you want to, you know, find a book about design that's that you you know it's interesting. Um I probably won't ever open it again. <laughs> but it was fun to look at. Listen, I re I really appreciate you. Um for being on this is interesting. How do ceiling fans impact overall CFM and events? That's a very good question. I don't know. I don't know. That'd be something to ask a ventilation specialist, but does it impact overall CFM? I don't think so. I don't think the air movement, as long as there's makeup air, I don't know. It's a really good question, Tony. Thanks for asking that. That's something we'll have to check out for sure. Too much fun. <laughs> Nick Lewis and you should write a book about function versus aesthetics. Maybe that'd be cool. <laughs> All right. No distraction going on. Well, I don't know about that. What's nice with a mo oh, modern ceiling fans that they have quiet profile. Don't distract. Yeah. The modern ones like Jackie's is a real super modern one and it doesn't distract. It looks like just, um, I don't know. I don't know what it looks like, but it doesn't look like a, a, a regular ceiling fan when I think of ceiling fans. So imagine you can, oh, what's this? Imagine when a kitchen where you can walk out of the kitchen directly into a kitchen garden in your backyard. That's cool. Um, I did a, oh, I didn't do the design. I had a, a consultation with a, um, a couple in Singapore and they had, um, an outdoor kitchen so kind of both but m the main part of the kitchen was outdoors which was really nice it wasn't a kitchen garden but it was an you know an outdoor kitchen and um not something of course that i would have been super used to where i live because outdoor kitchen is basically like your barbecue and that's it um but yeah outdoor kitchens are if you have the climate where you can facilitate that really really cool All right. I had a lot of fun. It was fun reading those things and just seeing how it goes. Uh, next week, we'll be back with another live stream. I thought I was going to have a guest this this live stream, but it just never panned out for whatever reason. So maybe next week we'll have a guest on and uh, we can be talking about 
kitchen design related things, of course. This Saturday's video is all about small kitchen design. I'm taking a client's kitchen, um, small kitchen, and going through the process of how to design it in various ways to get the most function out of it. Because even though a kitchen is small, it doesn't mean you don't have options. You always have options. And sometimes it just takes thinking and working through and letting the kitchen speak to you so you can really find out what those things are. Oh, my camera's saying, get up, go away. All right. Have a great uh, week, everyone. We will see you hopefully in the next live stream. And uh, give a thumbs up before you leave. And uh, God bless. Take care. Bye.